your life sir sanjay sir please okay uh welcome uh, all the members of rnc of the next society to our uh, second virtual uh, meeting uh, organized by deepak in fact uh, and i'm thank all the members of my team who are working so hard to arrange the academic for all of us to benefit uh i take this opportunity as president of varanasi of the new society to welcome dr santosh hanwar sir who is from hyderabad he is a young dynamic onco surgeon welcome sir and uh, uh uh i thank you sincerely for sparing some time for us and share your experience and expertise in uh, ocular tumors i would like now uh, to hand over the mic to uh, deepak to start okay welcome dr sanjay hello thank you sanjay sir now we are going to start our the monthly webinar series and this time we have none other than the master of the master santosh anwar sir with us he is the editor of ijo and very much interested in teaching the resident and most of the since he is the man behind the main residency training program uh, i focus in which we most of the residents who are here are the young ophthalmologist already joined us sir now i invite pravin chaturvedi to introduce few line about sir and after that we start our webinar officially hey and thank you deepak sir uh, today we, uh, we on behalf of uh, varanasi of ophthalmological society we have invited a very prestigious ophthalmologist of india he is one of the best in, in i think uh, i would say in the world is one of the best ophthalmoplasty and ocular tumor expert and uh, he has uh, done his uh, mbbs from bangalore universities and he is a uh, best graduate from there he is also a breast resident uh, during post graduation from rp center and he has also done his uh, service in uh, senior residency from the rp center he has uh, headed the department and later uh, the uh, was uh, worked as a uh, associate director at alvi prasad and is a adjunct professor at the university of rochester and ohio state university he is currently a medical director uh, the director of medical services center for sight uh, banzara hills uh, hyderabad and uh, is also a director of uh, uh, national retinoblast of uh, retinoblastoma foundation and uh, he is also secretary of the ocularplasty association of india and the vice president of asia pacific uh, society for ocular oncology and pathology sir has uh, lots of uh, publications in peer reviewed uh, national and international journals and uh, lots of lots of uh, awards into his account <laughs> major of awards are the shanti swarup bhatnagar award by government of india and the uh, pfizer national awards colonel rangachari gold medal award by aios ziglar international fellowship by orbis dr shiva reddy international award by aios and life achievement award this is the first uh, award given to any indian ophthalmologist this is a life uh, achievement award by american academy of ophthalmology and he is has been given uh, honorary fellowship from royal college of ophthalmology uk so i invite dr santosh from our sir to enlighten us with the knowledge of ocular surface tumors uh, both theoretical and practical we all welcome you sir thank you so much 
thank uh, Varanasi Ophthalmological Society, specifically the office bearers, Dr. Thakur, President, and uh, Deepak Mishra for the kind invitation. And Praveen, thank you for your very elaborate introduction. I was asked to speak on uh, conjunctival tumors. I've uh, kept it very pictorial and practical, not much of theory, but uh, for you to apply this knowledge right from, you know, the next OPD that you may see these patients in. Well, the newer generation may not know in this famous movie who is the villain and who is the hero, right? Sometimes it's very difficult to say which one is good, which one is bad, and which one is ugly. This is a famous movie, Good, Bad, and Ugly, but we won't know who is good, who is bad, and who is ugly unless we have paid very specific attention to their features. If this is your regular OPD where everything looks gray, everything looks like pterygium, pingicula, conjunctival inflammation, scar, etc., so in which would be hidden something that is ugly and that is generally a tumor. So let's go through some of the clinical examples. Now, if you were to encounter a patient of this sort where there is a well-defined, well-circumscribed lesion right at the limbus, overhanging both the cornea, straddling the limbus and with equal, almost equal amount of overlap on the cornea as well as the sclera with hair, it's nothing to worry about. This is just a limbal dermoid. And the treatment of choice, if the patient desires cosmosis is excision, or if the patient is symptomatic because of this hair growth, again, excision, or if the patient has astigmatism, again, for the sake of vision, you might have to excise it and repair tectonically. Whereas this is also something that you need not worry about. This is dermolipoma, any supratemporal pinkish lesion, which is by birth, which are acute crevice like this is a dermolipoma. Whereas something which is exactly similar, but more intense pink in adults and bilateral is orbital fat prolapse. These are nothing to worry about. But what you need to worry about is a child of this sort where there is bilateral choristoma, epibulbar choristoma, as you see here, with cutaneous tags and also bald patches. You see that the child has a bald patch here and also has pigmented nevi on the face, chest and abdomen. This is a cancer predisposition <laughs> syndrome called nevus sebaceous of Yadacid. So if you have a patient with or a child with bilateral choristoma, epibulbar choristoma with alopecia, pigmented nevi on the face, chest and abdomen, that is something dangerous and that's a cancer predisposition syndrome called nevus sebaceous of Yadacin. These patients need to be monitored for systemic malignancies and skin malignancies. Now, if you see a patient of this sort where there are multiloculated cysts, clear cysts or cysts with some brownish fluid or even blood, that's again nothing to be worried about. That is just a very initial manifestation of conjunctival lymphangioma, whereas this is a slightly advanced manifestations of conjunctival lymphangioma. A small lymphangic TCA can also present like this. But when you have large multiloculated cysts like this, which collates with each other, then that is generally a small lymphangioma, whereas this is a little larger lymphangioma. You should not be fooled by its vascularity and the dangerous appearance. This again appears very dangerous, but this is in a child, and this is nothing but a larger manifestation of conjunctival lymphangioma. You can see this corkscrew blood vessels, intralational hemorrhage, which spontaneously happen and resolve over a period of time is very typical of conjunctival lymphangioma. And there is a simple treatment currently. You can inject these lesions with pleomycin or for epibulbar lesions where you fear that pleomycin can cause corneal toxicity, you can simply vaporize these using RF electrode or carbon dioxide laser with results of this sort. So these are very easy to deal with. Now, if you have a very freshy pink lesion in the phonics, especially with a peduncle and a lot of discharge, then that tends to be a pyogenic granuloma or exuberant gland lesion tissue. This may follow prior surgeries, etc. Whereas a similar fleshy pink lesion with intralesional hemorrhage, which is not pedunculated but sessile on any part of the bulbar surface, including like a caruncle, is a conjunctival amyloid. You can see apple green birefringence in this. Conjunctival amyloid can also happen in the tarsal conjunctiva. Generally, it does not have systemic association, so you don't have to worry about it. 
these are translucent pink lesions in the palpebral and tarsal conjunctiva. So that's conjunctival amyloid. But you have a similar fleshy pink lesion with a lot of subconjunctival and intrastromal hemorrhages. Then that is something to worry about, especially if it is rapidly increasing in size and the patient is a young adult male it, and HIV positive, this is Kaposi sarcoma. This patient presented with a rapidly enlarging mass in the superior vulva surface, which was hemorrhagic and intensely vascular. And on excision, it confirmed the diagnosis of Kaposi sarcoma. You have a pale pink lesion, which you can call salmon pink, then that is a lymphoproliferative lesion. Just looking at it, you can't be sure whether it is benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia, atypical lymphoid hyperplasia, or lymphoma. Color is almost always the same. For example, this is very small, but this was lymphoma on biopsy, whereas this tended to be a little larger, but it was just atypical lymphoid hyperplasia. So you cannot go by the size. It could be any lymphoproliferative lesion, spectrum ranging from benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia to atypical lymphoid hyperplasia and lymphoma. So you have to biopsy to confirm the diagnosis when you see a fleshy pink or a pale pink lesion, which is called salmon pink lesion. So all these are patients with lymphoproliferative lesion. This patient was on brimonidin and had follicles which are attributed to brimonidin, but it didn't resolve at all even after stopping brimonidin. And on biopsy, it was found to be a case of palpable conjunctival lymphoma. This was again a patient with bulba conjunctival lymphoma. These are malt lymphomas which are easily amenable to treatment. You can completely excise them if they are excisable. Otherwise, biopsy and rest of the treatment can be performed after systemic evaluation of a patient has systemic lymphoma, then rituximab-based chemotherapy, or if the patient has only orbital lymphoma, then low-dose radiation, or even injection rituximab is going to work. Let's go to one more spectrum of lesions. This patient comes with unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis with redness, which is not going away, chronic unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis, not responding to conservative therapy for several months now. And on close evaluation, he has this conjunctival lesion, which has a papillary surface, and it is encroaching on the cornea with panis and vascularity. Now, in such patients, you cannot come to a conclusion unless you have flipped the lid and looked at the palpable conjunctiva as well and the lid margins. Here, you find that the lid margin is grossly thickened. This is the normal thickness of the eyelid and you can see the lid margin is thickened at least two and a half to three times here. This is the normal sharp posterior lid margin. In this area, it's all destroyed. Posterior lid margin is all rounded and there are no mebomain gland orifices in the uh, intermarginal area. So this is a patient with sebaceous gland carcinoma with pejetoid involvement, which may look actually look like a conjunctival tumor. But unless you have flipped the lid, inverted the lid and looked at the palpable conjunctiva carefully, you will be missing the diagnosis of squamous cell uh, of sebaceous gland carcinoma. In such patients, what we do is called MAP biopsy. We take biopsy from 17 different areas of the conjunctiva, mark it you mark each location, lay it on a filter paper and send it to the pathologist. Pathologist would tell us which part of the conjunctiva is actually involved with pejetoid uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma. And based on that, we treat it either conservatively with mitomycin drops or local excision, cryotherapy or radiation. Now, sebaceous gland carcinoma diffuse type mask rats as unilateral blood conjunctivitis and you should be aware of it when we talk about conjunctival lesion. Let's go to one more patient exactly similar unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis, but has these white dots, and that is nothing but keratin. So in the presence of keratin, the diagnosis changes completely. Keratin is a hallmark of epithelial tumor, which has a rapid cellular turnover. Presence of keratin would make you suspect that it is squamous cell carcinoma. So the only difference between sebaceous gland carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma in the bulbar surface, of course, Let's tell a different story is the presence of keratin in squamous cell carcinoma. Now, this patient was diagnosed by a cornea specialist as peripheral ulcerative keratitis or Boren salsa. He had conjunctival resection and blue BCL because of a thin gutter on the periphery of the cornea. That was where it was performed. Ultimately, the patient presented with a scleral nodule and a patch of keratin. This was actually squamous cell carcinoma masquerading as peripheral ulcerative keratitis. 
this patient presented with a sterile limbal melt and the patient incidentally had some history of vague history of joint pain it, it was thought to be a case of rheumatoid arthritis associated sterile corneal or limbal melt and the patient underwent excision of this necrotic area and a patch graft very nicely done but what was missed was the exuberant keratin that was present around that area and on histopathology it turned out to be a case of squamous cell carcinoma now this looks like necrotizing scleritis but it is definitely not immunologically mediated necrotizing scleritis because you see lot of keratin and keratin indicates that it is squamous cell carcinoma which is causing necrotizing scleritis so squamous cell carcinoma can also present like necrotizing scleritis some patients of oss and present with a corneal epithelial lesion which is more predominant than the conjunctival lesion this patient underwent had undergone ptk phototherapeutic keratectomy by a corneal specialist thinking that it was a superficial corneal scar but that was not to be after 3 months the patient recurred and you can see a small conjunctival lesion and a large corneal epithelial lesion you can see that it is actually at the level of epithelium and that is abnormal vascularity so the first thing that i talked about corneal or ossn was uh, keratin the second manifestation is abnormal vascularity and if you find a lesion which is placoid flat with abnormal vascularity slightly thickened even without keratin but with a corneal epithelial component then you should suspect ocular surface squamous neoplasia so these were the mass crats of ossn but when you look at the real ossn which are not mass crats you can see that it has a very wide spectrum all these six pictures are cases of ossn but each one looks different from the other so if the manifestation is so broad how would you be able to diagnose you should look at typical clinical features if in a conjunctival lesion keratin is present then that is 80% sensitive and more than 90% specific for the diagnosis of ossn this is with histopathology as the gold standard so if a patient has keratin then you start suspecting ocular surface squamous neoplasia apart from keratin if there is abnormal vascular pattern which is feeder vessel as well as intrinsic vascularity feeder vessels are conjunctival or epistleral or intrascleral vascular channels which are feeding the tumor whereas intrinsic vascularity is what you see within the lesion fine network of blood vessels if keratin and abnormal vascularity is present then you are more than 90% sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of ossn the third feature is rose bengal staining all these pink areas are stained with rose bengal now if a patient has keratin abnormal vascular pattern and also the lesion stains with rose bengal then you are as good as the gold standard that is 97% sensitive and 98% specific for the diagnosis of ossn so this one slide will tell you that if you have a what may look like a benign conjunctival lesion or a scar or a pingicula or a pterygium but it has a bit of keratin abnormal vascularity and also it stains with rose bengal then you should very uh, carefully evaluate it and suspect that it may be a case of atypical ocular surface squamous neoplasia and deal with it appropriately if you still have doubt then you can bring in anterior segment oct the gold standard is anterior segment oct as far as the imaging of ossn is concerned and there are very cl specific clinical signs in oct which will tell you that a particular lesion is ossn what is understood currently is that if there is abrupt transition of hyperplastic hyperreflective corneal epithelium you can see normal corneal epithelium is here whereas this is hyperplastic and it is white hyperreflective and normal corneal epithelium is grayish and it abruptly terminates with a snout like end and that is very characteristic of ocular surface squamous neoplasia on oct i'll give you some example this is definitely pterygium there is no doubt at all right and you would want to deal with it if there is any indication for surgery but when what looks like pterygium has this fleshy pink growth with abnormal vascularity with feeder vessels which are coming from areas which are away from the pterygium in pterygium you can see the vessels are generally restricted to the area of pterygium whereas if it is ossn you can find vasculature coming from all over to feed a hungry tumor 
So if there is excessive vascularity is present and there is this abnormal fleshy nature is present, although the vessels may look a little dragged, exactly as you see in pterygium, vessels are dragged, but the caliber of vessels is not very different. There might be some larger vessels, there might be some finer vessels, but ultimately the caliber is nearly the same. Whereas in OSSN, caliber of the vessels varies dramatically. You can see finer vessels, you can see very large vessels. That shows that these are abnormal vessels which are feeding the tumor and this is definitely ocular surface chemical neoplasia. This also looks like pterygium or may look like pterygium to an untrained eye, especially if this area is very subtle. Just this may look like pterygium, especially if this may be flatter. But you can see that the vasculature is of different caliber and vasculature is arising from all levels, intraconjunctival, subconjunctival, episcleral, and also intrascleral vascular channels, as you see here, that is again ocular surface chemist neoplasia. There's no doubt that this is ocular surface chemist neoplasia. This cannot be inflammation. Again, you can see abnormal vasculature. This patient did not have uh, keratin. This patient also does not have keratin, but you can definitely see that this is a large diffuse lesion involving both the palpable as well as pulbar conjunctival. Let's go to pigmented conjunctival lesion. In pigmented conjunctival lesion, the four main conjunctival lesions that you should be worried about or you should be concerned about, not really worried about the diagnosis, are complexion-associated melanosis, or also called racial melanosis, primary acquired melanosis, nevus, and melanoma. There are other pigmented lesions which are secondary acquired melanosis, blue cell nevus, toxicity, scleral melanocytosis, and melanoma mascarats which I'll not cover because those are not so common. Now let's uh, try to differentiate complexion associated melanosis from primary acquired melanosis and nevus from melanoma. Before that, let us look at the frequency of their occurrence. If you look at this particular large series of over 5,000 cases, you find that nevi are most common, followed by primary acquired melanosis and melanoma with almost equal incidence. So if you have 100 conjunctival lesions, 50% of them, at least in Caucasians, are pigmented and 50% are non-pigmented. And now we are talking about pigmented conjunctival lesions. If you go back home and look at your own parents or even siblings for that matter, even younger or elder, you'll find that most of our conjunctiva is pigmented. Slight amount of pigmentation of conjunctiva in Asian Indians is definitely not abnormal as long as it is bilateral. Only if it is unilateral, you start getting worried about. This kind of pigmentation, as long as it is bilateral, merely symmetrical, and has this cobblestone kind of an appearance, with even with fine pigment in the peripheral cornea, is something that you would not worry about. This is complexion-associated melanosis or CAM, also called as racial melanosis. We are predisposed to conjunctival pigmentation. This can also happen in individuals who go out in the sun or have ultraviolet exposure or where they are exposed to chronic irrita irritations such as uh, actinic or they could even have thermal irritations because of their occupational hazards. Then it could be reactive melanosis. But then basically complexion associated melanosis or reactive melanosis are bilateral and nearly symmetrical. You can find that this patient has bilateral melanosis, not very symmetrical, but definitely bilateral. So these patients are complexion associated melanosis and you simply have to observe them. And if they're cosmetically bothered, then you can resect them. But if you find that there is asymmetry like this, one eye has pigmentation, other eye is absolutely white, may have very subtle pigmentation, but not very significant then you should rule out primary acquired melanosis. This was a 45-year-old female with primary acquired melanosis and ultimately she developed lymphoma. So the way to differentiate racial melanosis from primary acquired melanosis, also called conjunctival melanocytic intraepithelial neoplasia or semen, is this is unilateral. Primary acquired melanosis is typically unilateral, occurs in middle age, it is flat, does not have much of thickness. There are no cysts within the lesion. 
and this has a risk for melanoma and as opposed to racial melanosis this has a peppery kind of a architecture you can see a magnified view here you can see that it is peppery whereas cobblestone would have a larger patch like this with a lucent area that is racial melanosis where is no uh, lucent area at all and confluent pigmentation but with dots and dots of pigmentation like a layer of pepper strewn over that is primary acquired melanosis now again if a patient has pigmentation of the phonesis you should rule out primary acquired melanosis right so if a patient has pigmentation of the phonix most likely it is primary acquired melanosis and not racial melanosis so all these four patients have pigmentation of the phonics palpebral conjunctiva and the carunculus and all of them have primary acquired melanosis this is again a patient who has a phonical pigmentation and if you look at the medial canthus there is melanoma so primary acquired melanosis can produce melanoma in about 20 to 30% of patients this is one more example of a patient with superior phonical primary acquired melanosis and there is this small nodule which was confirmed to be melanoma on histopathology now if you have 100 patients with conjunctival melanoma how many are contributed to by pam you might be surprised to know that primary acquired melanosis contributes to 75% of conjunctival melanoma whereas de novo and pre existing nevi are relatively uncommon 20 and 5% respectively now how do you suspect or clinically predict that primary acquired melanosis will transform to melanoma going by the clock hour if for every clock hour there is an additional risk so basically you go by the extent if it's just one clock hour then obviously the chance of it transforming into melanoma is very rare you simply watch this is again less than two clock hours you simply watch but if it is more than that if it is extensive then there is a reason to treat so when you have patients who have extensive primary acquired melanosis you have to completely excise it or whatever that is residual you have to subject them to cryotherapy so what is said in 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 the literature especially by the shield study is that for every clock hour of primary acquired melanosis there is a odds ratio that's 1.7 times the risk so if there is 7 clock hours of primary acquired melanosis then the patient has 12 times risk of developing a melanoma treatment is either by excision as i said cryotherapy or very rarely topical mitomycin c it works in a, in about 50 to 60% of patients only now let, let's go to the second spectrum that is melanoma versus nevus now if i were to ask you of these four pictures which one is a nevus and which one is a melanoma sometimes it may be very confusing because each of this looks different this is slightly fleshy has a prominent one feeder blood vessel this is slightly smaller away from the limbus this is very close to the limbus much larger again has a feeder vessel this has two feeder vessels and this is in the superior vulva conjunctiva so you might be confused so suppose a similar patient were to come to your clinic on monday morning what would you diagnose it as nevus or a melanoma let's see how would we go about diagnosing it you have a clinical checklist if you follow this checklist you should be able to diagnose a nevus from a melanoma the first point is interpalpebral location if a pigmented conjunctiva lesion is located in the palpebral conjunctiva between the two lids then it is more likely to be a nevus if you look at the four pictures three of them are in interpalpebral location only this is in the superior vulva conjunctiva the second point is variable pigmentation if you look at this picture you find that pigmentation ranges from very subtle brown or pale brown tan brown to dark brown so this is very characteristic of a nevus in a melanoma there is uniform dark pigmentation or some amount of fleshy component because of vascularity whereas nevi are variably pigment pigmented let's go back to these four pictures you can see that all of them have variable shades of brown they are not uniformly dark brown that is the second characteristic the third is nevi don't have corneal epithelial invasion this top shot at the limbus you may argue that okay this one has corneal epithelial invasion no it is just a large nevus which is overhanging on the limbus 
corneal epithelial invasion would look like this serrated or crenated margins with vascularity and pigmentation going across the limbus and continuous being continuous with the main tumor so none of these patients have corneal epithelial invasion precisely and that is one more point in favor of a nevus the fourth point is neva i don't have episcleral fixation and how do you test it you simply move the lesion through the lid you can actually do it like that on a slit lamp evaluation or use a wet cotton tip applicator and move the lesion if it moves on the episclera not fixed to episclera that is a nevus whereas melanoma will be fixed to the episclera neva i don't have intrinsic vascularity as i earlier mentioned intrinsic vascularity are blood vessels within the tumor whereas one or two feeder vessels are okay they are present even in a nevus the most important feature of all of this is the presence of microcysts nevi are spongy whereas melanoma is solid how do you know whether a microcyst is present or not you can actually look at it on slit lamp evaluation you can see this patient has microcysts as well as macrocysts in about two thirds of nevi cysts are clinically evident in others cysts may be evident on ubm or anterior segment oct so if a cyst is seen clinically on slit lamp evaluation you can be pretty sure that it is a nevus but if you still don't see the cysts on clinical evaluation you can always do a anterior segment oct and if you find microcysts or macrocysts that is very typical of a nevus because nevi are supposed to be spongy no clinical application of this test is in this young child 12 year old child a uh, son of uh, physician parents who brought us brought him with uh, with a history of recently noted pinkish lesion on the bulbar conjunctiva with slight encroachment on the cornea with a prominent blood vessels they were obviously concerned about it but it has no pigmentation at all but when we do imaging we find that there are actually microcysts confirming the diagnosis of an amelanotic nevus so whenever there are microcysts you tend to be diagnosing a nevus whereas if a patient were to have microcysts or macrocysts earlier and from there develops a solid component then that is a sign of transformation of a nevus into a melanoma so microcysts are coming out to be one of the identifiers of a nevus they are also the absence of microcysts is an identifier of a melanoma and sudden change in clinical appearance from a cystic lesion to a solid lesion that is again a melanoma this is my own patient where this child was under follow up for several years and was lost for follow up for about 5 years he always had a nevus here in the supranasal aspect this was from age 3 onwards and then he became a teenager and he was lost for follow up for 5 years 5 years later when he came back he had developed a large chocolate brown lesion with a pinkish component and also subconjunctival hemorrhage now let's look at this carefully you see that this particular area was a nevus and is still a nevus whereas at the advancing edge a solid lesion has appeared with lot of intrinsic vascularity and also feeder blood vessels this was elevated nodular fleshy with excessive vascularity so we imaged this patient and these the microcysts and there is a solid area so there are areas with microcysts there is a area with solid lesion and when we excised it and subjected it to histopathology you find that in the area where there are microcysts histopathology also shows microcysts and that is still a nevus whereas this solid area is blue and that is a melanoma that does not have any cysts and that is the zone of transition between a nevus and a melanoma which you clinically also see so this particular portion is still a nevus and this is a melanoma so what this would tell you is that if you do imaging very carefully if there is a solid lesion that is coming up in a pre existing nevus then you can clinically suspect that nevus is transforming into a melanoma this is a very typical melanoma you can see dark chocolate lesion with pinkish color that is mainly because of excessive vascularity and the lesion is transgressing the limbus and extending onto the cornea and this is a very obvious conjunctival melanoma there is no doubt at all about the diagnosis now the key to uh, diagnosis of pigmented conjunctival lesions is irrespective of where the patient may have a pigment you have to inspect the entire ocular surface 
In fact, only about one sixth of the ocular surface is palpable conjunctiva. Three, uh, five fifths, six of the ocular surface is all hidden. And unless you expose all that and inspect carefully, you will miss a lesion. For example, this is a patient who presented with pigmentation of the plica. We can simply label him as a plical nevus. But when you avert the lid, upper lid, and see carefully, you might find that there is a melanoma. So examination is never complete in a pigmented conjunctival lesion unless you inspect the entire palpebral and the bulbar conjunctiva and also double over to look at the superior phonics. So in summary for conjunctival melanocytic tumors, complexion associated melanosis is bilateral, nearly symmetrical, cobblestone kind of an architecture. You really don't worry at all about it. But if it is unilateral or severe, grossly asymmetrical and has peppery architecture, especially more than three or four clock hours located in the phonicial conjunctiva and the palpebral conjunctiva, then that could be a case of primary acquired melanosis that transforms to melanoma and you should be worried about it. If a patient has interpalpable pigmented conjunctival lesion, which is not crossing the limbal barrier, does not have intrinsic feeder vessels and has microcyst, then that is a nevus. You really don't worry about it. But if a patient has a fleshy component with a dark lesion with intrinsic vascularity crossing the limbus and extending to corneal epithelium, then that is a melanoma and you should be worried about it. So you know now what is good, what is bad and what is equity. You need not worry, simply recognize and manage. Let's very quickly go on to management. Deepak, how much time do I have? There no limit of time. Oh, no, no, yes, no. <laughs> Very quickly go over to the management. It was up to the 45 minutes, sir. So we have at least 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes. Sure. Okay. So let's go on to management of ocular surface tumors. There are three ways of managing ocular surface tumors. One is medical therapy. Second is surgical therapy. And third is radiotherapy. Topical therapy can be with chemotherapeutic agents, which is 5-fluorouracil and mitomycin, or immunotherapy with interferon, and there are specific indications. Now, mitomycin is a very strong drug. It is used in the concentration of 0.04% or 0.04 milligram per ml, easily prepared, and that is the cost per month of using mitomycin. It has a lot of ocular surface toxicity and side effects. Interferon almost costs the same as mitomycin for a monthly use. Interferon alpha 2b is what we use, 1 million international units. It comes as an injection of 3 million or 10 million international units, simply dilute with that with an artificial tear solution. And you have a final concentration of 1 million international units per ml, and that's how you dispense it. Interferon is very mild on the ocular surface. It's very friendly to the ocular surface, does not have any complication on the ocular surface or the corneal epithelium, but works very slowly. 5-fluorouracil is least expensive, used as 1% drop, comes somewhere in the middle. It is not as strong as mitomycin, not as weak as interferon, and does not have too many side effects. It does have corneal epithelial toxicity. So you can use any of these drugs depending on the clinical situation. Now, interferon is the current uh, favored medication because it is very gentle on the ocular surface. It can be used in three forms. One is immunotherapy. When you talk about immunotherapy, that means that you are aiming at complete tumor control. Immunoreduction or chemo reduction is when you want to reduce the size of the tumor. Suppose you had a 15 millimeter tumor and after treating the patient for about three months with interferon, it becomes five millimeter in size. Now you have a smaller area to excise. That is called immunoreduction. Immunomodulation is a recent concept where you want to enhance the immune system of the ocular surface by using one a day dose. This is specifically used in patients such as HIV positive patients who have a higher chance of developing OSSM. Let's look at some of the examples of immunotherapy. The most important indication is a small tumor. Small tumors can easily be treated with topical therapy and they go away in six weeks to eight weeks, which is a very good indication. The second indication is corneal ocular surface squamous neoplasia. This is my favorite slide. This is a slide which shows the use of topical therapy in corneal OSSM. This is a patient where my cornea specialist friend had done a biopsy from this area. 
rest of the tumor was treated with topical therapy. Now, what you see after three years is that in the exactly in the area where he had done a biopsy, there's a corneal scar. Rest of it is all clear. Suppose you were to excise this patient primarily, then possibly you would have had some scar in the pupillary axis, thus precluding good vision. So in a patient who has corneal OSSN, especially in a patient where there is pupillary axis involvement, then topical therapy is definitely indicated. In patients of this sort, topical therapy is ideal. This is one more example of a patient, a third graft in a patient with xeroderma pigmentosum, other eye is already lost. And unfortunately, the patient has developed OSSN at the graft host junction. Now, if you were to try to excise it, then you might induce either a graft rejection or a failure, and the patient has a precious third graft that he is seeing with. So, in such patients, again, topical therapy is indicated. After using interferon for about eight weeks, you can see that the OSSN has got completely uh, resolved. Now, if a patient has more than six clock hours of limbal involvement, Cornea specialist will tell you that if a patient has six clock hours of limbal involvement and if you were to excise it, there's a higher chance of limbal stem cell deficiency. Since such patients, again, you can use topical therapy, you can see a nice limbus maintained with no corneal vascularization or conjunctivalization. The fourth indication is diffuse oocysin, where more than 50% of the ocular surface involved. As you see here, this patient has almost the entire bulbar surface involved. Again, topical therapy works beautifully. So when does topical therapy work? It mostly works well in patients who have a flatter type of OSSN, whereas if a patient has a nodular large OSSN, then it may not work so well. So if you choose your patients carefully, then topical therapy works very well. Now, there is a role for injections as well. This patient has palpebral as well as bulbar conjunctival involvement. Earlier, these patients were exenterated. Now, with injection interferon, with sustained topical interferon, you can save these eyes. The same patient after about two years of treatment, you can find that he is completely resolved and his vision is well maintained. This is a patient again with diffuse OSSN with HIV zero positivity treated with injection interferon and he has resolved completely. So diffuse OSSN we generally treat with injection interferon initially followed by topical therapy. Example of immunoreduction. This patient has a large tumor of course, it is excisable, but if you want to make your surgery minimal, then you can reduce it. So from this size, it has reduced to this size by topical therapy. So how exactly does this work? Now, if this is the cornea and this is the tumor, the epicenter of the tumor is almost always at the limbus because OSSN is a limbal stem cell tumor that is surrounded by a zone of carcinoma in situ, severe, moderate, and mild dysplasia. Topical therapy takes care of carcinoma in situ and dysplasia. And what is left finally is the invasive squamous cell carcinoma that needs to be surgically excised. So it is based on that principle that you can immunoreduce or chemoreduce. And immunomodulation, as I said, is mainly for patients who have a higher chance of local tumor recurrence, such as xeroderma pigmentosum or HIV positive patients. When we talk about surgery in OSSN, surgery is very simple. Surgery would be an excision with tumor-free margins. And how exactly would you determine the tumor-free margin? By doing a good slit lamp evaluation. So beyond what you see, you have to go and excise 4 millimeter. Ideally, you should stain the tumor with rose bengal. And beyond the area that stains, you have to still excise 4 millimeter of normal conjunctiva. For the corneal epithelial component, you don't use... Uh, surgical instruments to excise because you want to preserve the Bowman's membrane. So you do what is called alcohol-assisted gentle keratoepithelectomy, not disturbing the Bowman's membrane. Lamellar keratectomy and sclerectomy are very rarely performed. What is very important is resection edge cryotherapy, which gives you an additional advantage. So when we have a patient with a larger tumor or a complex tumor, we always make a large diagram, just the kind of diagrams that retina surgeons make and take it to the OR so that after giving periverbal block, sometimes it is difficult to make out the margins. But if you have a large picture or large drawing like this with you, then it is very easy for you to map out and excise the lesion completely. I'll show you a simple case of excision. This is a very simple case, a small lesion with which you can understand the principles of excision. I'm marking four millimeter beyond the area of the tumor that is stained with rose bengal. And the margin is incised either with uh, a scissor or you can use if you have RF electrode that is much easier because that causes 
good hemostasis then lift the tumor off the epibulbar surface and dissect it to reach the limbus from the conjunctival side cauterize those feeder vessels it's important to cauterize them then apply absolute alcohol to the leading edge for the corneal epithelial component this is called alcohol assisted keratoepithelectomy once the corneal epithelium turns subtle gray you can scroll off the corneal epithelium to reach the limbus as i said os is in the tumor of the limbal stem cells and finally you have to do a very superficial limbectomy to excise the tumor so you expose the limbus from the conjunctival side expose the limbus after doing keratoepithelectomy alcohol assisted keratoepithelectomy from the corneal side and then finally excise the tumor of the limbus now this has to be done under visualization and if you must you can squirt vss so that the blood is all cleared and you can excise the lesion of the limbus that is reverse cryotherapy where you drape the edge of the conjunctiva over a 3 mm tip cryoprobe and freeze it and spontaneously thaw it this is double freeze thaw cryotherapy for the additional 3 to 4 mm margin that you would get out of it this is done twice over by doing reverse cryotherapy you know the end point you don't accidentally cryosclera and the uveal tissue if this patient has some limbal adhesion if you clinically feel that there is a limbal adhesion then you should cryo the limbus as well this is restricted to less than 3 clock hours otherwise you will have limbal stem cell deficiency this is also double free stock cryotherapy one or two clock hours of limbal cryo does not cause limbal stem cell deficiency then you finally repair the uh, excised area either using a conjunctival autograph or an amniotic membrane which is glued on here i'm using an amniotic membrane which is glued on which works very well since it is sutureless the patient is comfortable and can go back to work in 3 or 4 days these are some of the results of excision of oesis and 6 clock hours lesion excised one more patient with a sectoral oesis in excised now what is important in excision is that you should judge the base also very well and intraoperative oct actually can help you judge the base and the judgment of the base on oct intra or preoperative mimics what you see on histopathology so oct is a very good tool to judge the depth if you have a large ossn where you must excise it nodular ossn then you can do a primary simple limbal epithelial transplantation so that the patient does not have the complication of limbal stem cell deficiency now coming to adjuvant therapy if the resection edge is positive on histopathology if there is only dysplasia or carcinoma in situ and if you already done cryotherapy then you simply observe the patient if you have not done cryotherapy then you have to provide topical adjuvant chemotherapy or immunotherapy if resection edge is positive and that has invasive squamous cell carcinoma you are medical legally you are bound to reexcise it if resection base is positive and if it is localized and the pathologist is able to tell you that a particular clock hour is involved say 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock then you can do localized cryotherapy if resection base is diffusely positive then you have to resort to plaque brachytherapy plaque is also useful in treating patients who have scleral invasion patients of this sort where there is scleral invasion can be very easily treated with secondary plaque brachytherapy secondary plaque brachytherapy is when you excise the tumor in flush with the sclera and for the residual tumor in the scleral base you treat the patient with plaque brachytherapy it works beautifully well you can see large tumors with scleral extension all resolved following plaque brachytherapy now what is primary plaque brachytherapy primary plaque brachytherapy is used in patients who have a risk for tectonic uh, instability like patients who have a stromal melt or nearly full thickness scleral involvement if you were to try to excise this tumor then the patient will have a possibly a perforation or a corneal melt so here you place the tumor plaque right on top of the tumor it also works well primary plaque brachytherapy also works very well all these patients have been treated with primary plaque brachytherapy now in melanoma which is diffuse you can see that there is destruction of the limbus and corneal involvement and also this patient has anterior uh, segment involvement ciliary body involvement you can see the ciliary processes on ubm this patient had reasonably good vision he had in fact 69 vision luckily and he wanted to preserve the eye there again you can do excision and what is called rotational plaque brachytherapy where you treat all the involved quadrants of the ocular surface 
with plaque brachytherapy. And you can also use a conformal plaque where it looks like a semblephron ring with both the sides covered with radioactive material. You can use it to treat both the bulbar as well as the palpable conjunctiva simultaneously. In fact, strontium is also coming back, uh, trying to make it. Currently, we are making plaque in India with the uh, Atomic Research Center, and they are trying to make a strontium plaque as well, which can be very quickly applied and removed intraoperatively. Plaque brachytherapy provides about 80% success in eye and vision salvage in patients who have scleral invasion. Now, in patients who have intraocular extension earlier, I, we were doing either extended enucleation or excentration. But this young uh, individual who had intraocular involvement, as you see here with multiple prior surgeries with retinal detachment, he was very keen on eye salvage. Here we designed what is called stereotactic radiation in right to the tumor. And following stereotactic radiation, you can see that the tumor has resolved, intraocular component has resolved, and the patient is able to maintain his eye and vision. You can see complete resolution of the intraocular component, complete resolution of the ciliary body component with stereotactic radiotherapy. This I earlier talked about vaporization of conjunctival tumors, especially lymphangioma, is a reality now with carbon dioxide laser and RF electrode. We can uh, do minimal surgery with uh, good results. This is again a patient with diffuse conjunctival lymphangioma following vaporization. Last bit is about target therapy. Like in other malignancies, we have target therapy for the conjunctiva. For conjunctival lymphoma, if a patient has this larger lymphoma on the anterior aspect, that is easily excisable as you see here. But if the same lesion were to extend little towards the equator, but a very minimal component, you really don't have to give radiation for these patients, but treat them with peridional rituximab, 5 mg per ml is the dose that we use. Three weekly for six injections that will take care of the residual lymphoma. For conjunctival melanoma, for each mutation, we have a target therapeutic agent. This has all been worked out very beautifully. You can see some of the articles that are appearing in the literature, which have shown that conjunctival melanoma can resolve with uh, these target therapeutic agents. This is with nivolumab. And recently, we had an experience in our own situation where a patient got nivolumab for regional lymph node metastasis. He also had conjunctival melanoma recurrence, very subtle recurrence. After three months of systemic nivolumab, his conjunctival melanoma completely went away. So there is possibly an uh, indication for treating advanced conjunctival tumors with target therapy. So conclusion, I would say that ocular surface tumors are very interesting. They have a very wide spectrum. They are very common and they can present like mask rats, which may mimic other inflammatory and uh, benign neoplastic lesions. But then uh, diagnosis is always possible if you pay attention to very key clinical features. There are rapid uh, uh, new strides and paradigm changes that have happened in the management of ocular surface tumors, which are in the form of uh, new forms of imaging, target therapy, and innovative use of radiation, which have resulted in much better outcomes. We can nearly say about, what I would say about 99% of patients with conjunctival tumors, eye vision as well as life. Thank you so much. We'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Thank you sir. sir, for such a wonderful talk. And I truly accept that most of the things you just uh, informed us, usually we missed. In fact, we are in our day-to-day -day OPD too, that we are seeing these cases and sometimes we picked and sometimes we missed. And after your talk, hopefully our voice member will be able to judge more and more clinically sound after this talk. And Oja, sir, your final comments on sir's talk before we take questions. Sir, kindly unmute yourself, Oja, sir. It's a very exhaustive talk and uh, the talk is coming from a person who is uh, practicing this uh, oncology for a very long time. So it's a very, very uh, extended uh, and has a very long series of cases. And he has covered almost everything that how it appears 
how you will miss how you can treat by topical management and when the surgery is needed and when the surgery topical as well as the radiotherapy is can be combined but one thing i'll say that it is very easy to speak very easy to listen but very difficult to practice so all of us uh, i think have to revise it again and again and again and uh, we have to report our cases also in varanasi then only we will be benefited because the incidence of these cases are not much if you are seeing uh, in a week if you are seeing 200 patients 300 patients then also you don't find these cases but uh, i think uh, dr hanover can you kindly tell me the incidence of uh, squamous cell uh, carcinoma what is the percentage one, sir 1 in 1000 to 1 in 1500 in adults okay yes yeah, yeah. and they say it's so this is ha this is very rare sir but in a month you very might rare. be able to see one early case you know if you have yeah, a busy yeah 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 it's exactly mm-hmm. uh before your talk i was not um, uh, with your talk uh, you told about the keratin and uh, we have been uh, watching these cases and one thing is very clear that if the ophthalmologist is very careful then he can change he, then he can just the abnormality so i think sir you are i am right Yes, sir. If in the presence you of keratin, just, you, uh, you can right. just the abnormality. You can just the look. Yes, sir. And keratin, keratin is absolutely not present in benign cases. That's true. Keratin is a keratin uh, is never present. High cellular turnover, and that attack was mm-hmm. only in neoplastic lesions. Yes, and feeder vessels. Second thing is feeder vessels. If you see very abnormal vessels, so. i think sir everything is covered very well and it's a talk from a very big person so it's a very big benefit thanks to dr deepak that you have arranged such a good faculty and uh, i wish that in varanasi all of us should report our cases to a central pool so that we can share that how many cases we are getting in a month or so and what treatment we are following because many times many times you don't have interference easily available to you mitomycin is easily, easily available five filler uracil is easily available but interference many times is not available but uh, nearby cancer therapy centers mahamana center and nir center these things are available and uh, surgical excision is definitely not the uh, job of all the surgeons all of us cannot do the surgical excision it needs a specific training so sir is there and uh, i think he must be having training facilities also so anybody who is interested deepak can request sir for training if he is having slots sir is having slots thank you from my side thanks a lot sir salute to you thank you so much and as expected it was a great talk संजय सर टू बी ऑन लाइट लेटर साइड आई हैव सीन लॉट ऑफ दीज काइंड ऑफ ट्यूमर्स एंड आई हैव डेफिनेटली मिस डायग्नोज द वे डॉक्टर संतोषर हैज बीन हैज टॉट एस मैन इन डे टू डे प्रैक्टिस वी मिस so what i uh, suggest uh, deepak to uh, you know like uh, create a, a whatsapp group with dr santosh and our so that uh, if we are you know in doubt about uh, any congenital problem which may or may not be uh, malignant we should take uh, you know his clinical help and his clinical advice that would be very nice you know like uh, many time we uh, uh, 
you know, like uh, I have operated on cases thinking it to be a pterygium, but then he was telling us that it was actually uh, a squamous cell carcinoma. So uh, if we can uh, take his help clinically, and if he can advise us, you know, if we can send uh, him uh, a picture, anterior segment photograph of the lesion to him, and he can tell us that, yes, yeah, it, this is the problem, and, uh, you know, we can, uh, the, it, it, this should be the treatment plan, then uh, it will be a great help to us. Yes. And I would request uh, Dr. Santosh Hanover to, you know, like, uh, think over this kind of thing. Maybe his workload will increase uh, <laughs> uh, a lot, but uh, it will be a great help to us. Perfect. I'd be happy to do it. If he agrees to it, if he can help us uh, remotely. Yes. Yes, agree. To be on uh, lighter yes. side, uh, we will be sending all the cases to you on Central for Science at Hyderabad. <laughs> In fact, sir is helping us, sir. I have said many of my RB cases and other cases and taking the advantage personally. But your suggestion is good that we can have some uh, WhatsApp group with uh, WAS members so that the members from the WAS and this Purvanchal region can also be benefited from the help by the sir. And at least we have once in a week or once in a month clinical photograph discussion too if sir uh, allows us are uh, having some time for that and we will work how we can make it more feasible so that we can have some more guidance from sir too no, santosh you are not uh, you are not agreeing to it no, no i have agreed already sir sir already <laughs> said sir no <laughs> question happy to do it in fact i get a lot of uh, uh, whatsapp pictures on WhatsApp for opinion and, uh, you know, that is how it works. In fact, pictures uh, actually are very good. If you send... If you can, uh, if we can have your WhatsApp number and your email, we know your email account, we can uh, email you and, uh, you know, can send you by photographs uh, uh, through WhatsApp. And uh, you can, uh, you know, you can always guide us that what the treatment line should be. Sure, that would be help to the patients of uh, Purvanchal, uh, Varanasi, and nearby places. Send my number on the chat, sir. You can anybody can use it. So you uh, you have essentially agreed to help us. Definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, sir. It was such a wonderful talk. And thank you, Dr. Deepak and everyone for organizing this. It was too good. All the office bearers of us. Thank you, Preeti. Dr. Preeti, ma'am, you want to say something? No, I said it was such a wonderful, precise... Dr. Preeti, kindly no, unmute yourself. I have unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, of course we can hear you. Ma'am, we are uh, unable to hear you, Dr. Preeti, ma'am. Abhi, can you hear me? I have yeah. unmuted myself. I think this yes, is. It was such a wonderful talk. we are talk. unable to hear you. There is something your wrong voice is not coming. There is something wrong at your end, Deepak. We all are hearing your Preeti. <laughs> yeah, ma'am, you are audible. You go on. So, uh, thank you so much, sir. It was such a wonderful talk. And it was so precise, brisk, and actually, as Sanjay Boss has pointed out, we miss all these things. At times, we see only it as a, you know, for initial neighbors or a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, small neighbors. But we have never averted the lids and saw that how much has it extended. So I came to know a lot many things. And it was, I think, in my future, it is really going to help me. So thank you so much, sir, for such a nice call. And it was very well organized, all the office bearers. And sir has agreed to help us out also. So that is add-on benefit to it. Thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Sir, uh, there is no question after such an extensive talk. 
that everyone just trying to imagine and consolidate what they can do and we have the recording also on youtube so i will share it on the voice group so that if they want any time they can see it on the voice facebook and youtube too sir with your permission if you allow then we can share it on the voice group yeah and with this dr pravin i invite you again for the vote of thanks you have done wonderful moderation today thank you sir uh first of all i would like to thank uh, dr santosh anwar sir for such a wonderful and enlightening uh, presentation on squamous cell tumor ocular squamous cell tumor and uh, definitely all of us will uh, next time when we all of us see any pigmentation in ocular surface we will uh, uh, apply all these clinical knowledge for the patient benefit of the patient and i also thankful to president sir deepak sir diksha ma'am oja sir and all office bearer of the was society member um, family for organizing such a nice and wonderful webinar from santosh and our sir thank you thanks a lot sir thank you dr pravin uh, bhagesh sir kindly make us offline <laughs>